Hi EXers, welcome to the EX podcast episode number 14. This is your host, Stefan Vincent. I've started this podcast because I believe that companies have to think of themselves as employment brands if they hope to attract and retain talent. This podcast brings a different lens to the employee experience, a brand and customer experience angle rather than a traditional HR angle. Our guests, all thought leaders and disruptors in the EX space in their own way, come to this show to debate, discuss and share best practices on the key components that foster employee engagement and strengthen company culture, and also to spark the conversation on how to create positive employee experiences. Let's be real, employee disengagement is a big issue. Only 30% of employees worldwide feel engaged at work, and 20% declare they just don't give a crap about their work. The other 50% are in the twilight zone of engagement, not fully engaged, not completely disengaged either. There's not much companies can do with the 20% paycheck suckers who just show up at work because they have to in order to collect their dues. Instead, companies should focus on the 50% of employees semi-engaged. That's where companies can make a difference and impact their bottom line. Here, our guests share with you how we can make it happen together. Today's guest is Sarah Gay, Director of Organizational Effectiveness at American Savings Bank in the beautiful states of Hawaii. I really wanted to have Sarah on this show to share her story and to tell our audience that it is possible in a highly regulated and traditionally conservative industry to develop a real EX strategy. Today with Sarah, we will talk about how she led a successful employer branding and EX initiative, which best practices and lessons she brought from past experiences to American Savings Bank and what have been her main obstacles and how challenging talent acquisition is in Hawaii or in any other remote locations, and how companies can respond to these challenges. This episode is brought to you by Fusion Alliance. Fusion Alliance delivers holistic solutions fusing together data, digital, and technology to redefine customer experiences and move your ideas to execution. That's why businesses across multiple industries have relied on Fusion's expertise and partnership for over 25 years. For more information, visit www.fusionalliance.com. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you get a chance, please make sure to review the podcast on iTunes. You can open the iTunes app and type in Stefan Vincent or EX Podcast and you will find us there. And last thing, if you want to send me feedback, suggestions for future topics or guests, you can reach me at svincent at exsummit.com or on Twitter at ex underscore summit. Finally, check out our upcoming conferences at exsummit.com. All right, let's get to it. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the EX podcast. Very excited for today's guest, Sarah Gway, Director of Organizational Effectiveness at American Savings Bank. Sarah, thank you so much for being with us today. Good morning. Thank you, Stefan. It's good to be here. How is the weather in paradise today? (laughs) It's beautiful. It's a beautiful day in Hawaii. Always is. We are lucky to be here. I'm sure you are. I really like your LinkedIn summary. Instead of listing your current role, maybe we could you could describe your passion to our listeners. Can you tell us what it is exactly? Sure. So on LinkedIn, um, I've listed that I'm, I'm passionate about helping organizations unleash their potential by leveraging their greatest differentiator, which is their people. And that's, that's really true. That's something I'm just really fired up about. And I, I believe that um, in a market where so many of our services and products are basically just commoditized, um, an organization's people and its ability to leverage their unique talents is is really the secret sauce. And um, I'm excited to help organizations figure out how to do that best. Before we talk about what you what you're currently doing at American Savings Bank, um, it would probably make more sense to our audience to understand your EX journey and what led us on this show today. 
So let's start with your previous work experience at Pro Service Hawaii because you accomplished some really cool stuff around employer branding and employee experience. Sure, we did. We did some amazing work at Pro Service Hawaii. Um, and two things kind of jump out. Um, just to give the listeners some foundation, Pro Service Hawaii is the state of Hawaii's largest HR outsourcer. So their their primary um their primary services, HR, benefits, payroll, outsourcing, including some insurance products. Um, and they're an amazing, high growth, high revenue, um, fast growing company um, that I was able to, to do some work there around um, talent management and really leveraging their people to continue that really impressive growth trajectory. So two things really stood out that we did at ProService um, around their people. The first was we were recognizing that we were we were hiring really great people. They were working really hard for us, um, and and we wanted to figure out why they were working for us and and how we could continue to find more great people. So we decided that we wanted to spend some time developing our employee brand. We called it our employee promises, and the idea is simple. It's you know there's the basic employment agreement that's kind of implied, right? It, Yes. You give us 40, 50, 60 hours a week, and we give you a paycheck. But beyond that, there's this um, this kind of unspoken agreement of if you give us your discretionary effort, if you give us your heart, not just your head, what are we going to give you as an employer? What are the unique things that you can mm-hmm. you can tap into by being part of this team. And so we spent a lot of time working with our really high potential folks, our A players and saying, why do you work here? What is it that you get that's important to you? And we codified it and we, we put it all over the walls. We talked about, you know, these are our promises to you. Um, we promise that you're going to have an impact. You're going to be able to do great work here and have an impact on the company, on your clients, on the community. Um, you're going to be surrounded by other really awesome, smart people because we found out that great A players want to be working with other great A players, and we promised them that they would have an opportunity to grow. Um, and then, and then we delivered on those. We invested a lot of time and effort into growing managers, middle managers who could deliver on those promises, who could connect with their employees, and really make sure that we were delivering daily on those promises. So it was really it was a revolutionary project. We spent most of 2015 doing it. Um, and it still lives on today. It's helped them continue to attract and retain easily the best talent in the state of Hawaii. Was it a state-run agency or was it a, an agency contracted by the state? No, it's a private, it's a private, um, they're a PEO, a professional employers organization. Okay. How was yeah. it to work with, did, did you get any, any obstacles or did you see any obstacles working for the state when you went through that Journey. Um, no, we didn't actually have to work with the state. Um, I'm sorry, when I said they're the state of Hawaii's largest HR outsourcer, um, we didn't work with the state. They were just compared to the other HR outsourcing agencies in the state, they were the largest ranks. Okay. What, wh- where did you start in this journey? L- l- let's, let's take you know, step by step for our audience to really understand what is the process to put in place something like that. So where did you start? Sure. For us, it was a really interesting journey. We had two parallel paths going at the same time. We were looking at, as I think most small businesses, growing businesses do, we were trying to figure out our customer journey. Um, and that was a marketing and business development effort. Yes. And then we had a parallel path that started saying, well, what does our employee journey look like? How are we attracting and retaining um, the best talent in the state? And as we started working those two paths, we realized that um, our efforts were better focused on the tip of the spear. In other words, defining and really stabilizing our employee journey before focusing on our customer journey because those employee advocates, those employee ambassadors, those engaged employees were going to give us a better result in our customer journey. So we really pushed pause on the customer journey piece and focused on the employee journey. 
and on the employee experience and and codifying that through the, the through the employee promises. So what it was it was really a pretty easy process. We had a great talent assessment system already in in progress, and so we knew who our top um, top high potential folks were, and we just spent a lot of time talking with them, asking. Why did you choose pro service? Um, why did you Why did you come here? What keeps you here? What would make you leave? And really understood the values behind those top performers, and understood what it would take for them to connect with us as an employer. Um, we also asked some hard questions about folks who left. Why did you leave? What What was it about somewhere else that pulled you away that you were going to get something you weren't getting here? And learned a little bit from some of those painful lessons as well. And after a while, it just started becoming really clear. There were themes in the feedback we were getting, um, and we started drafting those themes together and then ran it by um, a few more focus groups of, of the right folks, and they said, yeah, that's that's it. And then it was wordsmithing, and then we rolled it out. And when we rolled it out, um, it was really an exciting time. We, we just went big and plastered it on walls and made sure we were talking about it every day. We trained our managers on what they really meant. Um, and then we had some systems in place to make sure they stayed alive. So we we recognized employees based on employee promises. Um, when we would talk to the company about core initiatives, we would tie it back to employee promises. Um, we really made sure that it stayed alive in our culture, and, and it has. It's, it's still alive and um, really thriving, and I think it's a big part of why they've continued to be successful and attract and retain really great talent. For those who are not familiar with the journey mapping, whether customer journey mapping or employee journey mapping, it's a fascinating exercise because you pretty much go blind into that process. I mean, you have some assumptions, but you really want to validate those assumptions or you want to discover things that you didn't think about or that you didn't know. So what was it like to go through the interview process with some candidates, some current employees, employees who left? And what did you build some personas based on the high profiles that you talked about? How did you right. get there? Uh, it was interesting. So in the customer journey process, we, we yes, we developed some personas. But in the employee journey, I would actually say a pretty singular persona came out. And we knew, we were pretty clear on the, the profile of a successful um, highly productive pro-service employee. Um, and we had quite a few models of them already. And so we, we knew who we were talking, who we wanted to talk to, and we knew who we wanted to hear from, and we wanted to know whose values, you know, we, we knew whose opinions and feedback we wanted. Um, and so while it's true, we, we wanted to go into it with an open mind. It is also fair to say um, we didn't survey everyone and we, we didn't necessarily want everyone's feedback because we really wanted to make sure we were appealing to and speaking to and connecting with that top layer of talent. Yes. When you go through the employee journey, obviously it's not the end of, of the process. And what is critical is how are you going to execute on your findings through the journey mapping? So what... what what did you do after you finalized that journey mapping? Yes. So when we, it was an interesting process when we started getting to the very end because, as I mentioned, themes started emerging. We were able to kind of bucket, you know, the feedback, and, and we were starting to draft the promises. Um, and it, that process was interesting, the wordsmithing process. Um, and that was just a lot of rounds of, our senior executive team looking at it and, and making sure that it aligned with the other kind of core foundational pieces of who we were, making sure it aligned with our core values, making sure, you know, the promises aligned with our mission. And then it was a lot of time spent in rooms with whiteboards and just a lot of, you know, is it promise? Is it commitment? Is mm -hmm. it, you know, and, and really just kind of poking and testing and, it was just fascinating, though, because once you got it, it just, it was crystal clear. It was, that's the right, that we've got it. It's there. 
And um, we were lucky because I, I so clearly remember rolling them out to our management team. And there was that, you know, that moment where you click next slide and you kind of watch the faces in the room and you just hold your breath, hoping that it's right. And you could just see it. They, they started nodding and smiling and, you know, they, it was right. And um, I don't think we just got lucky. I think I think we asked the right people the right questions and, and it worked for us. Obviously, it was critical to have leadership involved in the process, correct? Critical. Absolutely critical, yes. Was it, were they on board with the, the idea from the get-go, or did, did it take some time to convince them that it was the right way to do it? I think, I think like so many organizations, if you remember, we started with the parallel paths of the customer journey yes. and the employee journey, and I think like so many organizations, our executive level was focused on the customer journey because that naturally was where we were going to see the benefits of productivity, of yes. revenue, um, and, and income, right? But there was a critical discussion we had during during that that process where um, we were able to get them to see that that was really the second step, that the customer journey really was the second step in the equation, and that if we continued, you know, the talent journey that we were on, and we continued, you know, the, it really didn't, it was irrelevant for us almost to, to worry about the customer if we didn't nail our employee retention and um, continue to develop the kind of talent that we had, because eventually we wouldn't even be able to deliver on a customer promise. And we painted that picture pretty clearly. And um, I think it was pretty persuasive. Again, kind of that argument that getting the people um, motivated and inspired and productive and engaged, that is the beginning of the delivery of a customer customer journey. Yeah. What and they it? understood it. They understood it. And that, I would say that that is that is why one of the reasons pro service has been able to be so successful is they understand and they are an organization that really is driven by great talent and an understanding of, of why that matters. Was it easy to get employees, current employees on board? I would assume it was, but how about employees who actually had left the company? Right. Interestingly, it, it, it wasn't as easy as you would think to get employees on board because um, we had to, you know, I, I, we weren't perfect. Um, nobody mm -hmm. is, right? And so when we rolled these out to small groups of, you know, we broke the, the company into small teams and rolled them out into very granular discussions about what, what each of the promises meant and what it was going to look like in action and how they could hold us accountable. Um, we had some tough discussions about, you know, you talk about growth and opportunity. I've been here three years. I haven't been promoted. That doesn't yeah. feel right to me. So we had to do a little bit of acknowledgement that we haven't been perfect, but this is these are the commitments we're making going forward, and here's some of the changes we're willing to make. So um, it, that part was important, recognizing that we weren't perfect and that these were aspirational, but they were where we were committed to heading. It's a very interesting theme because since I've started this podcast, on a regular basis, the vulnerability and the candor uh, or candor of leadership and the CEO is very critical in uh, creating and implementing a true employee experience. So true. Yes, absolutely. You now work for American Savings Bank. Is it possible to drive the employee experience in a traditionally conservative and very regulated industry? It is. It absolutely is. Um, there are, I mean, there's no doubt that there are some, there are areas where you can't quite be as um, innovative or empowering as you might like. But I think it just still boils down to a basic philosophy around, you know, you're either going to develop a mindset around opportunity and trust and connection and um, empowering people or, you know, the flip side of that is operating in an environment of fear and um, regulatory constrictions and, um, you know, not not innovating for fear of what could happen. And so I, I think I think it's just 
it's risky to, um, I think it's risky to just default to say, well, it's a regulated industry, so we can't innovate, we can't be empowered. There's, there's a million ways you can still empower and engage your employees. And I would actually argue that it's almost more important in that environment to find the ways that, that employees and teammates can be empowered and, and, um, and, and engage and be inspired to be practical, what best practices or lessons did you bring from your past experiences to ASB? I think it was that. I think it was the idea that, um, you know, just this fundamental belief that if we hire, if we attract and, and hire um, adults and treat them like adults until we are proven otherwise, um, people will do the right thing and they'll do great things. And, you know, kind of encouraging that mindset amongst senior leadership, amongst middle leadership, and people who've been here for a long time who maybe haven't thought that way. Um, just, you know, bringing new ways of thinking about um, people and what they're capable of if we just give them the freedom to do great things. What so that was a big main, one. What are the main obstacles that you faced in the process? Um, one of the, I, I mentioned earlier that I do believe it's one thing for a company, an organization to, um, to develop things like employee promises or, you know, an inspiring vision, but that's at the very high strategic level to truly drive that on a day to day basis deep into the organization requires committed middle managers. They're the ones that are walking the talk every day with their teammates that are having their weekly one-on-ones. And here at the bank, that is challenging. We have 240 middle managers and, um, you know, having them really embrace the obligation of leadership and having them really embrace their role as a people connector, um, that's challenging. It's challenging even to just get in front of 240 managers. You know, it takes weeks of meetings. and yeah. um, But it's also just challenging when people have grown up with a different model of leadership. So it's really introducing um, and challenging their ways of thinking about what it means to be a people leader when they may not have always thought of their role that way. How do you get your message across to them? <laughs> uh, personally and slowly. I, I just, it has to be, it has to be in person. It has to be connected. It has to be inspiring. Um, an email isn't going to do it. A one-time brown bag training isn't going to do it. It has to come from an authentic place. It has to come from an inspiring place. People have to understand and they have to see why this matters. Um, and they, they cannot see it as one more thing that, that the company is putting on them as a manager. They can't see it as more to do on their task list. They have to see that this is, you know, the leveraging of their people, their connecting of their people. This is the critical path for them to reach their sales goals, for them to have their business unit be mm. productive. Um, and if they can see that, then I think they're much more open-minded. So it's, it's really connecting with the what's in it for me, for our middle managers. So you, you connect the dots between employee engagement, productivity experience with the business and the, the business impact. Yes, right. it's critical. Otherwise, I think you run the risk of just becoming another, you know, HR person who talks about the fluffy, happy stuff, uh -huh. but doesn't get the business, right? So it's, it's absolutely critical. And I think we as HR people have to recognize that. That if we if we want to drive truly the culture and we want to drive the, the people strategy, we have an obligation to understand the business and share with our stakeholders why this why this matters and how it connects to the bottom line. Another challenge for a bank is unlike a traditional corporation where you may have only one site or maybe a couple of sites and everybody is in the building, you have many branches, so you have to get the message across multiple sites and as you say as you said it takes a lot of face to face interactions to get that message across how many branches does american savings bank have we have 52 branches and they're spread out um, amongst all of the hawaiian islands as well so um, in addition to just having them spread out around the island of oahu you know it also involves a plane ride to to our other branches so Yes, that's definitely true. And I think any time, <clears throat> excuse me, I think any time you're talking about 
vision or or philosophy, there has to be a discussion around there's the company level, there's the organizational level, but then you really do have to take the time to talk about what does this mean in our world. So it may mean something very different on on the west side of the island than it does on the east side of the island, just given cultures and you know different demographics. And I think that's true anywhere. You have to take that high level um, concept and that's the role of the middle manager. That's the role of of the 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 HR leader is to connect that to each individual culture in the organization because there's tribes, right? And and as the company gets larger, there's more and more tribes, uh-huh. and you have to unify that that big picture vision with what it means for each one of those tribes. Otherwise, the tribes just stay disconnected from it. Right. Yeah, it's a good point. Did you put in, in place some specific training to the middle managers to go around the, the, not only the process but the right messaging to deliver to the employees? We have invested over the last year at the bank. Uh, that has been one of our biggest investments around people has been um, developing a series of, well, we, we actually revamped our manager training. So we now offer an, an amazing two-day training that starts with the vision and our core expectations and why they matter. And then it goes into the obligation of what it means to be a leader at, at the bank and what what the specific expectations of a leader are and what do those look like in action. And it's two pretty intense days. Um, and then that gets followed up by monthly um, workshops where managers come in and they practice their tactical skills, they practice their role, their, excuse me, they role model, they role play, um, their skills with our talent development department. And, um, and then we also have an annual leadership forum where we bring all of our leaders together offsite for a day and reinforce again, those core principles. So we really have invested a lot of time trying to help give managers those skills because, you know, if you, if you grew up and got promoted into a middle manager role because you were the top individual contributor, no one's ever given you the skills for how to lead people, how to inspire people or connect them. So we've really, we've recognized that we're meeting folks where they're at and we're giving them this, this, the skills and tools to do it before we can really hold them accountable for it. So that's the next step is, is then we start really holding people accountable for their leadership. One big question, one big concern when it comes to employee engagement initiatives or employee experience initiatives is how do you measure effectiveness or how do you measure the success? Because you know, depending on the size of the initiative, an organization is going to have to spend significant money and time into the exercise. But right. there's an expectation from the leadership that it's going to provide results. Yes. Do you have what kind of measurement tools do you have in place or metrics that you have? Right. So we've been we in 2013 we started doing a biannual engagement survey. Um, it's a pretty in-depth survey. Uh, we've started doing it annually now, and we take that very seriously. Um, including next year, we'll be actually using. Um, a manager's engagement survey results in their performance review as as one of the one of the pieces in their performance review, and we'll be giving we'll be getting annual data now. So every manager, um, when we receive those results back, is responsible for looking at their results, their trended results, uh, developing an action plan for raising their results to what we decided is the bankwide benchmark, which puts us as one of the top banks in the country in terms of engagement. So it's, what are you doing to get to this score? If you're already at this score, what are you doing to, to improve your engagement, to get even more of your teammates highly engaged? What's your action plan look like? And then quarterly, we review that with them, um, and they're responsible for reviewing their engagement act, their engagement action plan and progress with their executive vice president at least once a year. Um, so there's some accountability there. The next step for us, and where the you know where the magic really happens, is being able to quantify that, right? Tie that into productivity per FTE or full-time employee um, revenue. We're not there yet. That's the next step. Um, and as we build out our, our HR data analytics, that's where we hope to get. So for right now, it's measured by the engagement score annually with a progress plan and how they're going to improve, which, again, takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort, and managers have to be bought into that process. Yes. 
You talked about data and analytics. What do you have anything in place currently to capture all this data and to actually use it? We're just we're not as far as along there as I would like us to be. Um, we're getting there. Um, I think as a bank, we, we haven't necessarily, we obviously have some great data analytics in our consumer division, mm -hmm. but around our people, um, we haven't been capturing the data. So, and we haven't really known the questions we wanted answered. So in the last year, I've spent a fair amount of work, um, just developing the questions and what are the questions we want to answer and capturing the data so we can answer them. We're pretty close. We're getting there. And then obviously the next step is to baseline it and then start you know, being able to, to, to track ourselves and, where, and measure where we're going. Um, so it's, it's the right direction. We're just not as far as I would like us to be yet. Well, and it, it does take some time anyways, that, that's for sure. Uh, let's switch uh, slightly to a different topic still related to what you're doing, but at a high level because of where you're located. I'm curious to, to see, to, to, to understand... Is it is working in Hawaii a major obstacle in talent acquisition? Yes, a talent acquisition is very challenging in Hawaii. Um, Hawaii has one of the highest costs of living in yeah. the United States, um, and we have about, depending who you talk to, um, anecdotally, we have about a twenty percent pay differential less than uh, mainland employers. So you combine those two things, and it, it can be a bit of a hard sell. <laughs> Um, although the sun is beautiful and the beach is gorgeous, um, you know, groceries are expensive and gas yeah. is expensive and rent is expensive. So, um, so pulling candidates from the mainland is very challenging. Um, and so then, you know, our preference would always be to, to find local talent. Um, but even that is very, very challenging be due to the high cost of living. We have, we have a lot of young folks who graduate from school and go back to the mainland or go to school on the mainland and don't come back because of the cost of living. Um, so it's very, very challenging. And then even at the, you know, at the, um, entry level with role, with our hospitality and service industries, it's very challenging because, um, So many of those roles are very competitive. We have so many hotels. We have so many hospitality openings that it's it just becomes a revolving door. Folks can just move literally to the next resort down the street. Um, so it's, it's very challenging to to attract and then all the more important to retain them once you have them. So do you feel that the employee experience in one organization is even more critical in remote locations where not only do you have to fight with competitors for local talents, but you also have to fight with a distant location from the mainland. Absolutely. Absolutely. The other interesting demographic about Hawaii is that many of our businesses are small, um, small to medium sized businesses. So they feel that pain of turnover even more so, you know, the, the, the lost productivity, the cost of um, replacement, that that impact to their bottom line is even amplified more so for our small and medium-sized businesses here in Hawaii. So, um, yes, absolutely, the, the need to attract and retain and grow your talent here in Hawaii is, is more critical than ever. Um, it's really, it's an, it's an interesting workforce development challenge about how we as a state can start growing Um, our own talent and, and keep people here and make it a, a livable place for them to stay so that we as big employers in the state have a pool to draw from. What, what type of training is available in Hawaii when it comes to employee engagements, employee branding, employee experience? Are there any classes that people may be able to take or is it something that has to be done online or on the mainland? Yeah. You know, there's not, there's, we're, we're just starting those conversations. I think we are behind um, the mainland when it comes to having those conversations. There are a few employers who are doing it really, really well. Um, I've been really lucky to work for, for two of them, uh -huh. uh, American Savings and Pro Service Hawaii. Um, so there are, there are folks who are getting it. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, the business environment in Hawaii is a little slower paced than the mainland. It's a little more change averse than the mainland. 
um, and a little more traditional. So I think we're a little slower to uh, to be open to the value of the employee experience equation, uh, but it's getting there. It's it, it has to because of the the constraints around our labor market, and I think people are waking up to that more and more. But in terms of how to actually get the skills. Um, I think it's just people like myself and, and several of my colleagues and peers, you know, talking. Um, and there's a lot of panels, a lot of peer education, a lot of brown bags, um, a lot of that going on. For those who, li- who are listening to this show and may consider to maybe moving to paradise, <laughs> <laughs> what are the main the main industries, obviously tourism is probably the biggest one in Hawaii, but what are the other the other industries that actually are attracting talents? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, that, that kind of ties back to that workforce development strategy I was mentioning earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, Hawaii has yet to really be able to differentiate ourselves with with unique um, industries. So it's really what you would expect. It's banking, it's hospitality, tourism, um, healthcare is big. Um, we have a growing, it's very, it's very exciting. We have a growing technology um, labor market and that's really exciting. That is an example of a place where we've recognized the need. Um, there was a, a very shallow pool and an underserved labor market and we've we, through the university programs and some other really innovative training programs, we've been able to start growing a talent uh, community and also a technology industry, which is exciting. Um, and then and there's an agricultural industry. And really, that's probably a, that would be the big, those would be the big buckets. The majority of our economy is really driven by small to medium-sized businesses. Now that the remote workforce is expanding considerably, and people can, you know, for some organizations, people can work anywhere and at any time, really. And the time time difference between the mainland and locations like Hawaii is not necessarily a big deal because people either work around the clock or they just decide whenever they want to start their day and their day. And did you see that that trend in remote workforce may entice people to move to Hawaii and actually start and work remotely? I think you do see that. However, I think because we we are so remote from a mainland employer, um, I think that has some challenges around, you know, again, sort of the employee experience and the connectivity to a team. Um, And so, you know, I think it's different when you're a remote worker in Chicago who goes into the office once a week or once a month. But when you're a remote worker 5,000 miles away, on, uh, you know, six hours time difference, that's, that's a different kind of, that's a very remote experience. Right. And so, um, I, I would say, I think, I don't know that that's a real successful model here. It's a good point. And it has a cost too. For sure. Travel cost and so forth. Right. 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 Yeah. From a selfish perspective, I would, I would like to see, Folks with that kind of talent uh, find employment here and <laughs> here and bring their talents to to local businesses. Right, if they're going to come and work in Hawaii, I'd love to have them be part of our talent pool. Do you actually have do you have numbers by chance of the number of locals who just leave the islands because of the labor markets and they prefer to move to the mainland? So you talked about students moving to the mainland to go to college and they decide to stay on the mainland. Do you have any numbers? I don't have any numbers, Stefan, but it is a, I mean, unfortunately I don't have the numbers, but it's a well-documented challenge that we face. And, um, you know, we're talking about it. People are are really looking at how we can make, make the state more livable. Um, but there's an interesting, so there's the brain drain at the college level, right? The kids who are going away to school and Mm -hmm. don't come back. But then there's another very interesting um, drain that's equally as, as scary, maybe even more so to me, which is the folks, the mid-career folks who are in, you know, in their 40s, 50s, the next generation of senior leaders and executives who are deciding they cannot afford to live here. They can't afford to put their children through private school. They can't afford to own a home like they would on the mainland. Perhaps their their family on the mainland is getting sick or, or aging and they need to move back. So... Um, there's also this, 
very concerning exodus to me, uh, it could be very concerning to me uh, that there's an exodus of next generation leaders who are leaving um, because of this cost of living issue. And, you know, again, it's, it's critical that we address that because uh, otherwise we're, we're going to find ourselves in five to 10 years without, without those, those folks here. And um, that's concerning to me. So we're talking about it. Uh, I think progress is, is, slow to happen, but the good news is it's at least on folks' radar, and, and I know with the right kind of energy and the right kind of conversations, we'll, we'll start to figure it out. And something that we didn't address earlier, but for, for those who are listening to us, you are not from Hawaii, right? That's correct. I moved here 11 years ago um, for work, and I, I couldn't be happier to call Hawaii my home. It's, a, it's an amazing, amazing place. Um, it has some very unique challenges, but it also has just some of the most amazing people and culture. Um, it's it's just an amazing, magical, special place, and I'm really, really privileged to call it home. and And that's why I I'm I'm concerned and and want to make sure that we're doing everything we can today to make it sustainable and and grow, not just sustain, but grow. You said that you moved to Hawaii for a job opportunity. How was the integration? In Hawaii, you grew up on the on the West Coast, right? I did. I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, it was it was very interesting um, when I moved here. I moved from I grew up in a small town, and I moved here, uh, and I I started working in a in a small town um, on the east side of Oahu. That's very it's a very tight knit local community. Um, and it had its challenges. I, you know, I, I definitely was a newcomer and I was leading a team of folks. Um, so we had some adjustments. <laughs> there, was, there was a lot of testing me with uh, new foods that I had never tried before and, you know, new smells and sights and sounds. And um, I think they got a kick out of watching me try those new things. Um, but it was, you know, it's like so many other things. It's about respect and it's about um, being open and um, being empathetic and compassionate and just really wanting to understand. And, you know, it takes some time to integrate. Um, but I also think that it's, it's very, very possible. Hawaii is, a, is an incredibly caring, loving, authentic place that if you can demonstrate your own respect, they will respect you and embrace you right back. It just takes a little time. And you pointed out two very important qualities in the employee experience journey. It's the compassion and the empathy to the employees. Those are, it's not just about Hawaii, it's literally across the board. Those are very two critical qualities for any, anyone involved into the process. That's so true. And you mentioned earlier the authenticity of leaders. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, something like an employee experience you know, if you're genuine, if you're genuinely concerned about and, and you understand the connection between your employees and your company's productivity and success, that that comes from an authentic place. It has to. Um, and so, yeah, it's all connected, right? The authentic leader, the authentic connection to a real purpose driven mission. It's all connected. Now, at this time in the interview, I typically ask a few personal questions so that our audience can Get to know gets to know our guest a bit more intimately. My first question, my first question is, what makes you laugh and why? Oh goodness, I laugh real easily. Um, I probably laugh at myself more than I laugh at most things. <laughs> I might find myself funnier than most people do. Um, I, I I enjoy laughing. I think it's it's it comes easily to me, and it, it's a stress relief. So, um, gosh, I, a lot of things make me laugh. Um, Everyday things make me laugh. There's, yeah, there's, there's really not many things. Um, I think just people being silly. I think silliness makes me laugh. People who are just willing to just, you know, make a fool of themselves makes me laugh. What, what makes you laugh about, what are the funny things that you see tourists do in Hawaii? <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> That's a, that is a great <laughs> question. <laughs> uh <laughs> Oh gosh. Um, I, so there was, this is, there was a, my husband and I were at the beach one day and there was a, a tourist who I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't, um, 
he he was wearing I don't know if he maybe he had a fear of the water I, I don't know but he was wearing he was a grown man maybe in his in his 30s or so and he was wearing these these neon yellow floaties that I think were made for kids so he couldn't put his arms down he also had a neon yellow uh, like chest floaty as well and was wearing these neon yellow board shorts and a neon yellow snorkel mask on. So, like, covering his nose and his eyes. And he was a good hundred yards from the water the entire time. So, so I think um, I think just maybe, maybe to sum it up, maybe some of the fashion choices are, are pretty entertaining. And, yeah, I'll be taking away And just different before. people's approach to the beach, maybe. Yeah, I, 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 can, relate, I can relate to that. <laughs> What's, what, what's your favorite spot in Hawaii? Oh, my goodness. I have a lot of favorite spots. Um, you know, one of the things I think people don't sometimes think about in Hawaii, especially at least on Oahu, are the mountains. And the mountains are just beautiful here. We're, we're blessed with several mountain ranges, um, the Koola Mountains on the east side and the Waianae Mountains on the west side. And they're just absolutely gorgeous. Um, so as much as I love being on the ocean and being on the beach and in the water is really important to me, um, being hiking in the mountains is also really a special, beautiful place because you get it, you gain perspective there that you know gets you up high above above the island, and you can from several places you can see all the way from the west side to the east side, so you can actually get a sense we are an island, um, and that's that's a pretty magical perspective there's i've only been to Kauai, but there's a an amazing place which is i, I can't remember exactly where how it's named but it's a sort of a grand canyon on mm. the island of Kauai. yes waimea canyon is is gorgeous yes what's your favorite food <laughs> i wish i had a favorite food i am i i should be more picky about my food um i would say probably Mangoes, really good ripe mangoes, are hard to beat. You said earlier that when the your coworkers, when you moved to Hawaii, tested you on food. What was the weirdest food that you had to eat? <laughs> oh no! <laughs> uh, there is a there's a traditional Filipino food called balut, which is um, which is an egg. It's a chicken egg, and it's it's partially fertilized. So there's a small chicken, a, a semi-formed chicken in the egg. And it's a traditional food that they eat. And um, I had a, a student I was working with at the time, really, really sweet, 19-year-old, very macho young man. And he challenged me to eat one. So he, I had one and he had one. And he said, Miss, if, if you'll eat one, I'll eat one. And I, I just thought, there's no way I can do this. So I sat there and kind of played chicken, if you will, with him. Uh -huh. And I started kind of cracking it. He started kind of cracking it. And it was the funniest thing. He just finally dissolved. And he said, oh, miss, I can't do this. And so I was off the hook. <laughs> I didn't have to eat it. And I didn't make him eat it either. So balut is probably the one thing that scares me the most. Balut. All right. Is the way for our listeners to follow you and American Savings Bank on the social media? Absolutely. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. It's um, Sarah Gay. Last name is G-U-A-Y. Um, and you can find American Savings Bank at asbhawaii.com. All right. Well, thank you for your time, Sarah. I really appreciate this conversation. We, I know it's early in Hawaii. It's almost 8.43 or so, correct? Yes. It's a beautiful day, beautiful morning in Hawaii. And what's the time difference between, let's say, Hawaii and the West Coast? Uh, gosh, I think we're supposed to get up to 90 degrees today um, with about 80% humidity. So I think our friends in California might be beating us on the temperature, but um, I, think, I, I think it might be a little more pleasant 90 degrees here today. Okay. <laughs> and I'm recording this episode in Phoenix, Arizona in the oh. end of June. It's 116. Oh, my goodness. But my no goodness. humidity. Which is nice. Yes, I'd encourage you to come out to Hawaii for a little while. <laughs> yeah, it would be it would be a, a, yeah, it would be cooler definitely. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, thanks again, Sarah. I appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. It was really my pleasure. 
Thanks for tuning in to the EX Podcast. If you want to learn more, visit our website at expodcast.com. If you want to find out more about our next conferences, go to expsummit.com. Finally, you can also find my manifesto on business to employee or B2E branding at b2ebranding.co. See you next week.